Yachts for Sale and Charter YouTube channel here, opening a window into the world of yacht brokerage and answering the question today, do I have to pay tax on my yacht? I have to pay tax on my yacht? That is one question, and actually I'm answering quite a few other questions because I thought while I'm here in the hotel in Istanbul, this is a good opportunity for me to catch up with some of the questions that viewers ask in the comment section below. And I'm starting with that very question. Rob Kay watched the video, what is the future of yachts for sale? And he said, will you please advise what the situation with tax is? I note that some vessels for sale state that the price includes tax or is net? Who sets the prevailing tax rate, as this varies from country to country? Recently, my brother was questioned by UK Customs about the Rolex he was wearing, and he'd paid tax on it. My question is, if I purchase a yacht in Italy and bring it to the UK, what, if any, questions will I be asked? I realise you may have covered this topic on another video, and I really don't want to go through the full back catalogue of videos to find it. Perhaps you can point to the relevant video, I would appreciate it. But well, actually, Rob, no, I've never covered the subject. And one of the reasons that I don't talk a lot about tax is because as a yacht broker, I really do view my role as marketing and selling yachts in pushing a sale through because often there's a lot of obstacles to getting the yacht sold. And your job really as a broker is to break down those obstacles and, and make sure that a smooth transition takes place. The tax question is so complex and so difficult that thankfully the yachting industry is full of qualified tax advisors. Some of them are lawyers, some accountants, some are companies that just uh, handle yacht ownership structures and a good broker will always advise the appropriate company to you um, that can give you the best advice on tax. Having said that, I can answer a little bit of your question, um, which is that when a vessel is for sale and it says not including tax or net of tax, it's almost always referring to value added tax, VAT as it's called in the United Kingdom, TVA in France, EVA in Italy. And as you rightly say, each country seems to have its own tax regime. I lived in Italy for many, many years and in the years that I was there I saw VAT go from 15% to 17.5% but on some projects it was 21%, they've gone up to 22%, they come back down again. So it's a real moving target and a very, very complex issue to address. However, I can say this, Years ago, there were many, many structures to help yacht owners not pay tax when they buy a yacht. They'd open up a company in the Cayman Islands or the Virgin Islands, and it was relatively easy to get away, if you like, without paying VAT. These days, that's not the case. It's very, very difficult. Um, governments have become wise to these various schemes, and it's really far more advisable now just to pay the VAT in whichever country you're supposed to pay it. Now, your question was very specific. You said, what if I purchase a yacht in Italy and bring it to the UK? I suspect that you would probably have to pay the VAT in the UK. The thing is, the service was rendered in Italy, so some would argue that that's where you have to pay the VAT, but actually you're going to be using the yacht mostly in UK territorial waters. Again, that's why you need to have um, an expert advise you on exactly where to pay the VAT, but one thing's for sure, you will have to pay it. Interestingly, it wasn't so long ago that there were all kinds of leasing schemes all over the world. One of them that was very, very popular and very successful was called Maltese Leasing. And the idea was that you would pay the yacht in instalments and pay VAT on each instalment on a, at a reduced rate. I think the minimum rate at the time was like 5.4%, which obviously is much lower than a full VAT uh, percentage. You'd pay the instalments at a reduced rate, and then if I recall correctly, the final payment, which is always a laughably small amount of money, you'd pay VAT at the full rate. You could do that if you flagged the yacht in Malta. And at the end of it, the Maltese authorities would give you a VAT paid certificate so that you were able to demonstrate to the authorities that it was a VAT paid yacht. It was a very successful system. 
I don't believe it's any more long, any longer available, I'm afraid. Interestingly, the Italians did a very similar thing, which was called, of course, Italian leasing. They did a very, very similar thing, but they didn't give you a VAT paid certificate at the end of it, which always absolutely blew my mind. And it made it very, very difficult for yacht owners, if they were boarded by the authorities, to demonstrate that they have a VAT paid vessel. It also made it very difficult when it came to selling the yacht, as I found out when I did sell a VAT paid yacht um, many, many years ago that had used the Italian leasing system. I remember the only way we could demonstrate to the buyer that it was VAT paid was going back through every single invoice that was paid in the installments and showing on the invoice where the VAT had been paid. So it's a hugely complex issue also because laws in different countries in the EU are changing constantly, especially in Italy, but also sometimes in France and Spain. So you really do need a specialist. Just to expand upon that, if you're not an EU resident, if you're not going to use the yacht in EU waters, you don't need to pay that tax. That's absolutely uh, indisputable. And actually you are still allowed to use the yacht in EU waters for a limited period of time. So many people will take their yachts in and out of EU waters to be able to benefit from that. Also, if you charter the yacht, it becomes a commercial vessel, it's your business. You don't have to pay VAT on the yacht. You'll notice that I focus mainly on EU waters and EU taxes. That's because in just a few days, I hope to fly to the United States and I'll be talking to some American yacht brokers about taxes in the United States. In fact, it's my intention to do a series of videos about buying yachts in the United States, how you do it, what you need to be aware of, what the process is, what taxes, if any, are due. And the question that I'm asked so many times on this YouTube channel, what's that all about when it says not for sale to US residents in US waters? I'll get the answer for, for that for you as well. I did say I'd be answering a few questions. On to the next one. Bob Juniel. David. Now he just watched the video of La Rima, the beautiful gentleman's yacht. If you've not watched that video yet, I'll put a link on the screen because it's a, a lovely yacht to watch. Anyway, Bob says, David, we really need to know the cruising range of yachts. Some twin engine yachts can double their cruising range by cruising a one engine and one propeller. Hmm. I'd question that. But anyway, by alternating engines, it, does, it doubles engine life. Australia lies between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific. Antarctica is 4,555 kilometers each way across the Great Southern Ocean. Even coastal cruising in Australia, a circumnavigation is around 15,000 kilometers. With Indonesia and Southeast Asia to the north, the draft of the vessel, depth sounders and navigation equipment are of premium importance. You said it right, La Rima is a true gentleman's yacht, ideal for the Mediterranean. Thanks, Bob. Thanks as well for all the research and all those distances. Actually, um, Yes, you do need to know the range of a yacht. There's absolutely no doubt about that at all. And every video I do, I try to include a little bit more information, a few more details all the time. So I take that on board that in future videos, I'll try to always include the range. Um, however, please be aware that just because a yacht has a 5,000 nautical mile range, it doesn't mean that it's appropriate to take it across the Atlantic or to take it to Antarctica, for example. Far more considerations than that are important. The shape of the hull, the material of the hull, the uh, general seaworthiness of the vessel. Some boats are just not made to go that far out at sea and take the sort of pounding that the oceans can put against some of those yachts. And the yacht builders make no, no apology for that really because that's not what the yacht's built for. Some particular yachts are just built to go to the Bahamas and back. In the case of La Rima, I wouldn't say it's just ideal for the Mediterranean. It would be a wonderful yacht to have in the United States and to use in the Bahamas. And I, I can just picture it going up the Chesapeake River and, and taking it to Martha's Vineyard. There's lots of places in the world where you could really enjoy using a yacht like that. Um, but you certainly wouldn't take it across the Pacific to Australia. It's just not the sort of yacht that you'd want to do that in. So yes, range is important, but something that I often say on this YouTube channel is just because a yacht can travel that distance, 
it didn't mean it should travel that distance. One of the good things with a big range on a yacht is that you don't have to fill up the tanks so often. Actually, Super Yacht Captain has got a great video about filling up a Super Yacht. And um, remarkably, for such a topic, it's one of his most watched videos. But you'll see it's, it's quite a palaver, for want of a better word, to refill the fuel tanks on a yacht. And so the least often that you can do it, the better it is. And so for that reason, you really want to have a good range on the vessel. Thanks for the question, though. Great question. Move on to the next one, which has a quicker answer unless I got sidetracked on this, which I might do. Ken Allen Dronsfield, a poetic voice. Now he'd watched the video about the Fed ship Gitana and he says, greetings, David. Greetings right back to you, Ken. Today, I have a question on a subject that I have never heard discussed on your channel or any of the other yacht channels out there. And that is, how are these gorgeous soup yachts heated? Many of them travel into the North Sea and the fjords of Norway, as well as Alaska, the USA coasts and Canada. The crew and guests on board certainly must get cold in those areas. So that's it. Hope you'll cover this in an upcoming episode. Take care and cheers. I actually did reply to Ken. I said, thanks for the question and I will answer it in a future vlog. And here I am answering it. Actually, there's kind of two answers because the simple answer is that most yachts with air conditioning have reverse cycle air conditioning. You can literally just go stop it from blowing cold air and make it blow hot air. That's the simple answer. Um, yachts though, which are more likely to spend a lot of time in cold climates do have dedicated heating system, often supplied by Webasto. I think that's the correct pronunciation. And when I was thinking about this question, it reminded me of um, years and years and years ago when I was first working for Ferretti Group and they weren't even a group at the time, actually. I think it was called Ferretti Craft. And I was working um, in the shipyard in a place called San Giovanni Marignano. And I didn't even know what a yacht was. I was just learning all about it. And I'll never forget, um, a client came from Finland and I think he bought a Ferretti 225, 22 and a half meters. I think it was the biggest in the Ferretti range at that time. We're talking about the 1990s. And he wanted this Webasto heating system in the boat because he was going to use it in Finland. And sure enough, Ferretti obliged and they did it. It was a big project for them to install that system on board. But then I'll never forget um, attending a meeting with him and the head of engineering, in which he asked for a Perspex windshield on the Flybridge Helm Station. Now the Flybridge Helm Station was like a box with a chair behind it and a steering wheel. And you had your instruments there, which were fixed. And quite rightly, he said, when he's operating the yacht from that position in the freezing cold air of Finland um, and the boat's going along. He's got that freezing cold air hitting him and he just wanted a Perspex sheet fitted to protect him and they would not fit it. And I will never forget, temperatures started to raise, figuratively, of course, between him and between the head of engineering as the head of engineering refused. And at one point, he even wanted to pull out of the contract for the yacht. Anyway, in the end, the compromise was made. They did fit it for him. It was almost invisible. I think the head of engineer was worried about the aesthetic impact. And as you know, that for Italians, the looks of a yacht are so important. Um, and it just really went against the grain for him to make this extra addition. So there's a little story. And I hope as well that answers your question, Ken. Moving on, Dimitrios Siganis asks the question, what is a gentleman's yacht? Is there a specific category of yachts that can be described as gentleman's yachts? To be honest with you, Dimitrios, it's a term I just throw out there without too much thought, to be really honest. Whenever I see an older looking retro style yacht that's obviously built for cruising rather than for high speed, I kind of refer it as a gentleman's yacht because at the end of the day, I'm a marketeer, I'm a broker. I want to sell the vision, I want to sell the dream. And there's something very romantic sounding about gentleman's yachts. As far as I'm aware, there's no real category of yachts that you can put that into. I've saved a comment till last because it made me smile and chuckle. It was by Random Guy. And he also watched the uh, Larima video. It's quite a long uh, comment, but it's worth bearing with me as I read it. This is the second Yacht Tour YouTube channel that has recently commented favorably 
on the old-style sailboat locker catches, where one sticks a finger inside a hole to activate a latch without apparently knowing why they are no longer widely used. They are colloquially known as finger breakers because in rough weather, sticking a finger through a small hole into a locker with heavy or hard items loose inside was a recipe for disaster. If the boat rolls heavily or lurches into or off a wave, all one's body weight suddenly wants to follow the boat but can't because of one tiny little finger which breaks. Alternatively, the can of soup you wanted launches itself from one side of the locker and lands on your unprotected finger as it curls around to activate the latch. On a custom yacht and a power vessel, that might be okay, but can you imagine the lawsuits on a new build production sailing boat? And if that were not bad enough, a broken index finger might also make it hard to subsequently press the subscribe button with a correctly modulated amount of force appropriate to the action. One last thing, ribs, aka frames, are not stringers. Ribs run athwart ships across the hull at right angles to the keel, while stringers run longitudinally along the hull parallel to the keel. Well, random guy, you are of course absolutely right about stringers. They are the longitudinal reinforcements. Actually, in Italian, they have two words. They call them longoroni for the longitudinal reinforcements and madieri are the ribs. But generally speaking, when you talk about stringers with people who know about boat building, which you obviously do, people understand what you're talking about uh, as the reinforcements of the hull. So, all it leaves me to say is, before you stop watching this video, for heaven's sake, don't anybody put their finger in a hole and break it. But first, gently stretch across your keyboard and delicately press the like button. And also remember, I do have an Instagram account, which I'm uh, excited to be able to put behind the scenes coverage on. If you want to watch that, the link is below. And remember as well that I'm doing a lot of newsletters now, especially since I'm traveling from Istanbul to Fort Lauderdale and all kinds of other places. And I'm excited to be able to keep you up to date with our travels and a bit of information about the crew and the team or what's going on and some inside information on what I'm not able to tell you about on this YouTube channel. You can sign up to that newsletter too at a link below.